we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Dwight Mitchell, the founder and CEO of Family Preservation Foundation, stopped child protection services from legally kidnapping children, lives and practices what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. so eloquently stated, that the greatness of America is the right to protest for right. Because Dwight Mitchell believes and knows, as Dr. King also stated, that the ultimate measure of any man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands in moments of challenge and controversy. Dwight Mitchell is one of America's true heroes who has stood tall in moments of great personal challenges and turned a legal battle for his children against the Minnesota Child Protection Services into a non-profit 501c3 organization called the Family Preservation Foundation, representing over 5,000 parents whose mission is to defend and preserve the individual rights and liberties guaranteed to children and parents in this country by the Constitution and the laws of the United States as it relates to child protection services and foster care. Dwight Mitchell is also the president and founder of Mitchell & Associates, a leading international management consulting firm. And here is Dwight Mitchell now to share some of his story of the Family Preservation Foundation's history, mission, and accomplishments, as well as how his personal story motivated him to help others with the same challenges. On February 16th, 2014, uh, while out to dinner with my wife, uh, CPS came into my house, uh, took away my children, my, and put them in the foster care. Um, I was completely unaware of why they would do such a thing. Uh, I, I was devastated. Um, who wouldn't be devastated if, if they took away your three children with no explanation? Uh, you didn't know where they were. Uh, you didn't know what was going on. Um, it was akin to any parent's worst nightmare. Uh, the, the only phrase that, that comes to term is kidnapping. That's the only thing that, that will give any justification or would help me explain to someone what transpired. Uh, your kids are gone and, and you don't know where they are and they won't tell you where they are in this. Well, one of the, the things that is the most uh, heart-wrenching aspect of this entire process was that I had no idea where, where my children were. For 22 months, I had no contact with my middle son whatsoever, no phone calls, uh, uh, no letters, no, no communication, no, no contact whatsoever. Um, the government said that they weren't going to tell me where the children were. Uh, I had no visitation whatsoever. Uh, and so from a parent's perspective, it's, you know, it's like they, they were ripping out a part of your soul and just torturing you for, for, for no valid reason whatsoever. There was no justifiable reason for what the government did to me. I realized that the only way I was going to get my children back was to learn enough about the law to, to fight for them and get them back. I was going to get my children back no matter what the cost. I learned enough about the law that, that uh, I could file my own motions and represent myself in court. What was what was uh, very interesting about my whole process is that I was represented by legal counsel uh, for the first 17 months. Uh, I then uh, let go of my counsel, uh, represented myself, filed three motions before the court, 
to release my child. And at the very next hearing, which was 30 days later, I had my son back in my custody. Um, when I saw how the process actually worked, I wanted to help other parents. And this is what led me to form my organization, Family Preservation Foundation, so that no other parent would go through what I went through. I was determined to be an advocate for uh, the less fortunate people who didn't have you know, my education or background and to educate them on the law and what they should and should not do as it relates to child protection services. In this insider-exclusive Justice in America Network TV special, our news team visits with Dwight Mitchell and his attorney in Minneapolis, Minnesota, to go behind the headlines to see the challenges their organization faces and the progress they are making to improve Minnesota's child protection laws. This is the Insider Exclusive, live from Minneapolis, Minnesota. my great pleasure to introduce Dwight Mitchell and okay. Eric Cardo. Thank you. We're here in Minneapolis today talking about a very important issue that deals with child protection services. You have been through the ringer with your own personal case and you represent many people who are in the same situation. Tell our audience a little bit about your backgrounds before we talk about the case. Dwight, you're a computer consultant, right? Yes, I'm a managed consultant uh, in the IT industry. Uh, I travel around the world installing large ERP systems for multinational companies like Shell, Merck, Mobile, those are some of my clients. Right. Never in the world did you think you'd be in the legal profession too, right? I did not, especially after 52 years or 33 years actually in, in the computer industry. Right. But it came about from a personal experience, which we will talk about in a minute. And Eric, you told me before the show, that you primarily sue the government. Right? Yeah, is it sort of, there's never been a lawyer in the state of Minnesota who's uh, made a career out of suing the government. And uh, I've been doing that for 25 years, over 150 published appellate cases. Right. I've sued every level of government, uh, state agencies, uh, counties, school districts, townships, uh, uh, cities. And uh, it's been uh, very rewarding because we win a lot because the government's violating all the time. You would think the law enforcing officers would follow the law, but they violate the law. In Minnesota, they're law violating officers. I'm just kind of curious when you've got 150 appellate opinions, uh, some trial judges don't know the law themselves, do they? And they rule against your case. That's why it's on appeal maybe sometimes? That's right. And often, uh, you know, you have a local judge reviewing the local uh, uh, government officials' conduct, and you, you lose in district court, but on appeal, it gets straightened out because the appellate courts understand that they need to have a uniform standard statewide. Right. And that simple rule is that state officials and local officials should follow the law. Right. In a nutshell, Dwight, again, you were never involved with legal issues before until what happened? Well, I was 52 years old and, and my son had been misbehaving in school. Uh, he wasn't doing his homework. Uh, he wasn't doing his chores. Uh, he was just, uh, for lack of a better word, going through the dum-dums, as I like to call them gave him what I considered uh, uh, ordinary corporal punishment. I gave him a spanking on the behind. And how old was he? He was 10 years old at the time. Okay, and you were, you were divorced at the time, correct? I was divorced. Background leading up to that, the divorce might have been contentious regarding custody. That was an understatement. My, my, my former wife had, uh, for inexplicable reasons, uh, stopped taking care of the children. I was living in London at the time, working with Johnson & Johnson. I was called back to the United States uh, because there were family issues at home. Uh, I was given custody of the children. My former wife did not want to adhere to the court rules. Uh, she kept breaking the uh, restraining orders that were placed against her. Uh, the children were put in my custody while we were going through the divorce. Um, she hired a hitman. A hitman? A hitman. To, to kill you? In order to obtain the passports, because I had the passports and she had bought tickets to take the children to Spain. And she was caught trying to kidnap the children and, and take them to Spain. 
What happened to the hitman situation? <laughs> the hitman, believe it or not, called the police because he felt that what she was doing was wrong. The police put out a sting. They recorded, uh, they captured her on a video and audio, uh, making plans with who she thought was the hitman, who was actually an undercover police officer. So they had everything on tape. So even after this, you still had to go through the Child Protection Services removing your children. That's correct. That's amazing, isn't it, Eric? You know, it's outrageous. The Child Protection Services, I think in part because, uh, as you see, uh, uh, Dwight is an African-American uh, man, uh, believed his spouse. But this was a convicted felon who had been deported to Spain in a, cons a conspiracy to kidnap the kids and, and harm Dwight. And so how does a Child Protection Services agency align with a felon like that? When Dwight, obviously, is an upstanding uh, man who had an ordinary spanking, and then he lost his kids for 23 months. Yeah. Now, usually, a person in your situation would hire a lawyer to help them out. You mentioned you filed a motion pro se. Uh, initially, I did have a lawyer, and um, I was not happy with the uh, uh, lawyer services, and so not ha we don't have to name any names, but not happy in what way? Not being as aggressive as he should be. Things were getting worse instead of better. Instead of me getting my, my, my children back in what I assumed would be a reasonable period, they, re, they released my first two children. My three-year-old, they returned to me after five months, and my 15-year-old, they returned to me. It was the 10-year-old they wouldn't release. Where were the kids in the interim period of time? Uh, they were in foster care. So my, my middle son was in foster care for 22 months, so I didn't see him. I didn't speak to him. Uh, no, I received no letters, no contact. I didn't know where he was for, for 22 months. Yeah. Now tell us the problems you face going up against C Minnesota CPS, Child Protection Services, in trying to demonstrate you were the better parent, the really the only parent that your kids could safely live with. What were the problems? Well, the, the, the problems were they were not listening to their own experts. So uh, two of their own psychologists uh, had gave me parental evaluation. So the first one gave me an evaluation and said, I was perfect, give Miss children back. They're like, no, we, we don't want to do that. So it, they hire experts. You don't want to do that. The supervisors of these? It was, not only, it was not only the CPS workers, it was their supervisors. I went all the way up to the director of Dakota County Social Services trying to get someone to listen. I said, look at the evidence. You've had the evidence since the second day that this started. You called New Jersey. You received all the official documents from New Jersey. Why isn't anyone listening? They're like, we don't have to. This is Minnesota. When does Eric enter the picture here? Eric enters the picture when, after I got my son back fine after 22 months, I filed a federal loss. It's kind of, it's kind of funny because uh, he called me, and because of the nature of my practice, I don't have time for fact-intensive disputes. And so I, I pushed him away. And then he worked pro se for a while, and then he came back to me in the federal lawsuit. So it was kind of because uh, I'm looking for a particular type of case where we can uh, get a remedy against, in this case, state agencies. That's huge. And, and uh, his case represents that. You eventually, thankfully, got your kids back. I did. It was a long, hard fight. You have three kids? I have three children. Three boys. Three boys. And um, they've been with you now for how long? Um, I've, I've had them back. I've had them all back for five years. Xander came home in December of, of 2015. Do they understand what their dad had to go through to get, <laughs> get them home? They do. And it, when they came home, we all sat down as a family, and I actually took them through everything. Xander had no idea what was going on. Xander had asked to come home multiple times, and they refused to allow him to come home. They actually told him that I didn't want him to, to return. I didn't want him to come Social back Social services. Home. Social services. It's in writing. It's in their documents. And so uh, everything that, that I'm saying is, is documented. So they have these case notes. And I guess they're so brazen and so arrogant that they wrote everything down. And so when I received discovery, I got 600 pages of discovery of all of their case notes. And I started going through. I went through every single page. And I just started pulling out all of these documents uh, to show what they were doing was, was illegal. As you're talking, I'm thinking to myself, you're running another business. I am. You, this is, must involve a tremendous amount of time. I wasn't sleeping. I really wasn't. I was, I, was, I was traveling for work. Now, Eric, you filed a federal lawsuit after this, after he got his kids back, on behalf of Dwight, as well as his new foundation, the Family Preservation Foundation, correct? Yes, that's correct. Tell our audience a little bit about that lawsuit that you filed. 
after we, the lawsuit became known, hundreds and perhaps thousands of single parents, particularly single mothers, were contacting us. And unlike Dwight, they were state court losers, not state court winners. So these were people who had lost their children permanently or had their parent rental rights terminated. And then we took a close look at the statutes. And in Minnesota, the child protection can seize the child for any touching. I mean, it's just a horrific uh, incorporation of different statutes, but quite simply, in Minnesota, it's child abuse if you meet the elements of assault, battery, or malicious punishment of a child, but they specifically excluded the criminal defense, which is a parent reasonably touching the child to uh, protect them, discipline them, clean them. And so in Minnesota, e even a touching that everyone would agree would be proper right. can be the basis for seizing a child. Like a spanking. Right, even like an ordinary spanking or, or an ordinary cleaning. If, if, there, if there's some allegation of touching, then the department can seize the child for an indefinite period of time. Yeah. And it, it's so uh, unusual. Uh, all the other states don't have this. In oh, fact, the, the, the deep blue states, Hawaii, Oregon, Massachusetts, have said, we can't have such a low standard for seizing children anymore because we have single parent families. And if we seize children from single parent families, then the government raises the child and the government's horrific at it. So there's agreement now between red states like Oklahoma, deep blue states like Hawaii, uh, Oregon, Oregon and Massachusetts, that we can't have such a low standard because the government is horrible in administering the foster care system. As a result of your lawsuit, what's changed? Uh, the, the, the lawsuit we're seeking, we're in the a circuit now, we're seeking a, a court injunction so the Department of uh, the department cannot use this unconstitutional low standard anymore, yeah. so they'll have to go back to the drawing board. The Child Protection Services uh, policies will be obliterated by the lawsuit. So because it's on appeal, what happened at the lower federal court level? At the U.S. District Court level, uh, we lost on jurisdictional and technical grounds. And so now we're up in the Eighth Circuit. Twice this has happened before to me, and the case has ended up in the U.S. Supreme Court. We've won. So we're not intimidated by the U.S. District Court judge. We just continue. Tell us about your organization, the Family Preservation uh, Foundation. Well, after the incident happened to me, um, initially, like most parents, you're in shock. You don't think your child can be taken with something as simple as uh, uh, a simple bottom spanking. So I, you know, I, I was going through this process of, of trying to understand what went on. So I, I formed uh, the Family Preservation Foundation. It's a 501c3 nonprofit. And the goal is to keep children out of the, the hands of CPS whenever possible. You know, what really got my attention is when I learned that 84% of the children in Child Protection Services are there for non-physical reasons. So there's 500,000 children that were put into foster care last year. $29 billion was spent on it, and I'm, I'm looking at this process. And so because I'm in IT, I'm very data-driven. So I went back and I started looking at statistics and figures. And so everything is there, and based upon the Freedom of Information Act, I just started doing an analysis of what I saw. And you know, at the end of this analysis, I said in a 10-year period, I'm like 2.6 million children have been put in the foster care. You have a Facebook page, I believe? I do have a Facebook page. You also page. have two websites. The two websites are Family Preservation Foundation yeah. is, is our foundation, our 501c3, and the Stop CPS from Legally Kidnapping Children, that is our, our family parental rights group. And so yeah. that's the group that's doing, um, that the lawsuit is representing. Okay, so let me ask you this, Eric. When you say there, it was, um, you lost at the initial court level, the district, federal court district level, because of a jurisdictional issue. What was that? Uh, principally, uh, the court found that there wasn't standing. Standing uh, the, by whom? For the association and, and, and for Why is that? Because, because the case has been completed. Uh, so so the, I'm, I'm, we're working on behalf of state court losers yeah. and a state court winner, Dwight Mitchell, yes. and we're saying, well, we've experienced the system and there have been unconstitutional harms and so we want prospective relief from the court. Right. And, but these cases are going on every day in Minnesota state courts, these CPS cases, and people are being uh, affected by these unconstitutional seizures. Okay, so let's, since you've been through the ringer and you know all about this case, let's 
educate the public a little bit about what a parent can or cannot do. So I'll ask you some questions. Do parents have the right to refuse entry to an investigator from CPS? A persistent uh, uh, effort like that would result in seizure of the child. Persistent denial? A persistent denial would lead to seizure of the child. I think the question is, could this lead to seizure of the child? Yeah. yeah, yeah that would lead to a seizure of a child. Do parents have the right to know why they are being investigated? Yes, they do. Parents do have a right to know why they're being investigated. Okay. So somebody comes, knocks on your door, we're from CPS, can we come in? Do you let them in? I would not let them in. And why wouldn't you let them in? Are you violating any law by You're not, not letting violating them? any law by not letting them to the but house? You're raising the red flag for them. You, it's it's really not raising a red flag. It's it's why do you want to come in? Yeah. What evidence do you have? Okay, so they're at the front door. You advise them not. Should you answer any questions? You don't have to answer any questions. It's entirely up to you. But anything you say can and will be used against you or twisted. Something you might think is benign. They will, they will use again. Are they writing these downs or are they recording them? They do both. They do. Are you allowed to record the questions? You are allowed to record. You are allowed to record the conversation. You are allowed to record Can you say to them, I want to record this? Yes. And, and I tell everyone to that? do that. What if they say no? They have no right to tell you no. Can parents refuse to have the investigators interview the children? Parents can refuse, but in Minnesota, uh, Minnesota can go around the parents' back, go to the school, and talk to the children without the parents' permission. What do you tell your children? What do you tell children right now on camera when an investigator comes and says, we're from CPS, we want to ask you some questions. What should you tell the kid to say? I will only speak to you with my parents present. Okay, and they have the right to do that. They have a right to do they, that. They will not be removed. They will not be removed. Some kids are removed from schools. That's correct. What other advice do you have for parents who are currently going through a situation like this, what are their rights? What we tell everyone who calls the foundation is that the number one thing they need to do is, is to be quiet. Um, in Minnesota, if... You know, quiet means speak very little? Speak very little. I mean, you can be polite. You can be cordial. Uh, you can, they can say, we're here to investigate, you know, uh, allegations of child abuse. Yeah, it's we're, it. by the way, I'm just kind of curious. In your case, your ex-wife made false allegations. Yes. She's a convicted felon. It didn't matter to CPS whatsoever. Where do most of these allegations come from? Neighbors. Uh, Neighbors, or how about contentious divorcees? That happens more than probably not. Yeah. Meaning um, most of the people that I have come in contact with their former spouses have made allegations of child abuse, especially if they're going through a, a contentious divorce. The way to change any law is not only in the courthouse, but also by state legislatures. You know, our whole goal now is education, and trying to get legislation. Right. right, and that's the goal of this show. And I want to thank both of you for being on the show. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. You can get more information about our guests and the issues at insiderexclusive.com.